Hi traders, hi traders, welcome, welcome, welcome to another broadcast of Live Trading Talk with Oliver Velez. My name is Oliver Velez, of course, and I am your trader for life. Hi traders, welcome, welcome. Another week, another week, another show. We're putting under our belt here today, and um, I actually couldn't be more excited. And I know I say that every show because I am challenged by you. You know, I'm challenged every single week by you because every single time I do a radio broadcast, or at least every single time up until this point, you have told me that, Oliver, I don't see, I don't know how you do it, man, but that last show was the bomb. That last show topped all of the other former shows. And so I am challenged. I'm challenged every single week to try to beat my last show. <laughs> And I know one of these days I'm not going to be able to do it because no uptrend lasts forever. But so far we have an uninterrupted uptrend, and that is the comment that I received virtually every single time that we've had a broadcast. Now, I do have a number to make up that due to travels, I have not been able to, to keep absolutely a full weekly schedule. So I think I've missed maybe two or three, and we will get those made up. So some weeks in the future, in the near future, there might be in, and will be actually more than one show. And I will typically do that extra show on a, on a Monday or a Friday. Those tend to be my two lighter days throughout the week. And that will likely be, those two days will likely be the days I use to put out an extra show. Because by the end of the year, I've shared this with you a number of times by the end of the year, I do want a minimum of 52 shows on the, the record. Another thing that I have every intention of picking back up is my YouTube channel. And I know that many of you are missing the trading videos that I post, that I, that I regularly posted for over a year to build up that channel. And in particular... There was a, a thread entitled Trade the Open Like a Boss. There are 18 episodes of that specific channel on my channel. And it is one of the most popular trading channels on the internet, on YouTube. And if you are not familiar with those videos, I strongly encourage that you go to YouTube and you search my name or my handle, OLVELEZ007, and subscribe to that channel. Now, for almost a year, actually a little over a year, I posted live trading videos. So I would actually trade the open for 20 minutes on average, and I recorded the 20 minutes. And of course, I would have to edit it down because how many of you are actually going to watch 20 minutes of trading. So I'd have to edit it down to the most beneficial and useful parts of the 20 minutes. And I would actually talk you through the trade as if you were there. Now, many people who actually partook of these videos have told me that their trading has been radically changed. Their entire view of the market has been radically cha changed, their approach to trading, their belief system. And so my journey, my attempt was to have a year-long journey, which I did accomplish, a year-long journey of really having you with me during my trading sessions in the open. Now, of course, because of the long editing hours, I could not do every single day, but I tried to do the mornings that I believed had something very powerful to share with you. And so if you are not familiar with that, please go to that channel, subscribe. But here is a very special instruction. I strongly encourage that you listen to that series, all 18, but you do it backwards. So there's a tendency for people to say, oh, wow, there are 18 episodes of Trade the Open Like a Boss. I'm going to start from episode one. I want you to start from episode 18, and then I want you to go backwards to one. You see, that will make sure that you start with the most relevant to now and then go backwards in the past versus the other way. I just have my gut reaction tells me that's just that's going to be more beneficial to you. Also, my editing skills. <laughs> 
my editing skills improved quite dramatically. Now, a lot of people um, are surprised by the fact that I actually did the editing because it was so special to me, traders, that I did not want someone interpreting my stuff. I did not want that. It. This is pure me, all right? And I cover some of the most cherished tactics and techniques and strategies that I teach my traders, and I show it to you trading live. So during an actual trade, and I'm explaining it to you. So I think those videos have a tremendous value to anyone who is serious, not only about trading, but about trading the open specifically. I am an open specialist. I have learned over the past 29 years really how to come out of the blocks very, very strongly. Um, as a former market maker, the, this is one of the skills is absolutely necessary in order to keep your job. I did it very well, and I teach that style of market play off the open to my traders. And so you can get a little taste of that through that YouTube channel on that specific channel in the channel, Trade the Open Like a Boss. Again, that's youtube.com forward slash OL Velez 007. Now, I haven't posted one in quite a while simply because the advent of Periscope has sort of changed the dynamic in a way. So, to me, bringing you in to the live trading right at the moment that it's happening has a little bit more panache, doesn't it? Does it not? Versus an edited polished version of live trading that happens that I get to you two days later. But Periscope has changed the dynamics, so it has created less of an urge for me to create the polished, although I do certainly believe there's a space for both. I think that there is a space for both, like a Coke and a Pepsi. Um, but it's so time-consuming that it's very hard, but I will definitely get back to it, not at the same regularity and not at the same frequency, of course, because I don't need to with Periscope and especially now Facebook Live, but there will be some of the more polished ones that you can go over. Now, let's not forget that our Periscope Live trading sessions disappear after 24 hours, and now that Catch has officially gone out of business um, that was a, a service that was designed to capture your periscopes and archive them forever. They did not raise the, um, I guess, the appropriate amount of funding to continue the business model and um, are going by the wayside. And so Catch.com, which had all of my former periscopes archived, is actually going out of business. So another alternative um, will certainly have to be the case. One alternative, I believe, is fullscope.tv, and um, there are several others as well. Of course, each Periscope trading session is saved on my cell phone, so I have the ability to post those to the YouTube channel as well, and and while I don't believe that every single Periscope of mine is worthy to to have a shelf life forever, those those which do will likely find their home on the on the YouTube channel. So that's another reason that I strongly encourage that you subscribe there. Also, my future intent is to really make the, the YouTube channel multi, multi, um, uh, linguistic for lack of a better term. Um, the, ch the channel will be in Spanish and of course it'll be in Portuguese as well, ultimately, um, in a total way. But anyway, thank you so very much for con your continued support with the radio show. I'm very glad that a growing number of you are finding the topics that we discuss here um, very touching and, and, and very valuable in, at some specific level in your trading. Now, as I've mentioned many times, this radio show is not about current events. I don't. I never did have an interest in doing a radio show about current events where we banter about a company's earnings or what happened in the market today because... In reality, current events are not current almost the moment that you finish talking about them. And so I did not want a show that had its episodes just disappear into the ether and 15 minutes later have little to no value. I wanted a radio show where we could truly archive each specific episode of that show, each specific broadcast, and each broadcast would have a timeless nature to it that you could literally come back to any one of our broadcasts 
of the past on any given day, no matter how old and find it still relevant in your life as a trader, that the broadcast should be, in my vision, in my view, relative to any brand new trader that starts today, that even if you mature to the point of being a master trader, that you could pull virtually any episode, any broadcast, and find some value in it five years from now, 10 years from now. So that's the goal with this. We tackle timeless topics. We tackle the topics that the industry really doesn't want to speak about very frequently because they're not so sexy sometimes. And sometimes they're not so flattering or glamorous. Sometimes they actually discourage people from really wanting to do this versus going in a starry-eyed fashion without the appropriate amount of information and facts under your belt headlong in with your family's jewels and all the money you saved and worked for your entire life. And so we attack those things. We deal with them intimately and we deal with them purely from a trader's perspective. I'm not interested in speaking to people who, you know, want to play the Rip Van Winkle approach to the markets where they buy a stock today and they hold it for 10 years and go to sleep and hope everything is okay when they wake up. That's cool. If that's your thing, that is just not my thing. And that is not really who this show has been designed for. This show has been designed for those who have a passion for the markets, those who, who have recognized that this activity that we call trading is the last bastion of total independence, that those who know in their heart that is very difficult, but if I manage to get this, I am in business from all four corners of the earth with simply a notebook, computer, and internet connection, and Oliver Velez. <laughs> that those who realize that this is not just a game of money making, that it's higher than that, that you can make it higher than that. It is almost an activity that is that has some spiritual elements because before there's even a hope of becoming a master trader, you have to first master yourself. And how many people in life actually reach the point in any endeavor, in any human pursuit, where they truly master themselves? So this is a very special activity. I address those who recognize it as such, and that those individuals I refer to as my family, my extended family. All right? So... We have a very interesting topic to discuss today, all right? And that topic is commissions. And guys, let me tell you that commissions is one of those very, 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 very dark topics in our industry called trading. At commissions, ladies and gentlemen, which is seemingly going away, but I'm here to tell you that it is here stronger than ever, and actually, and it's just simply more hidden today. So, what I would like to do is to reveal to you that. Commissions, the cost, one of the only costs that we have to do this is one of the darkest secrets in our industry. And it lies deeply embedded in the fabric of the market. The commission game has changed and evolved over the past two decades in ways that I believe would astonish you, that are going to astonish you when I reveal them to you. We today see ads on television to open up accounts here. Come here and I will give you 500 free commission free trades. Come here. We hear this all day long. We hear firms that have come into existence 
and say, listen, we are a commissionless broker. You do not pay commissions. These are some of the things that we're hearing today. We have stopped hearing terms like payment for order flow, but it still exists. It's just simply more hidden and camouflaged today. So we're going to tackle this topic of commissions, your cost, what you pay to your broker. And let me tell you, it's bigger than you think. It's bigger than the number that shows up on your statement as under the column called commission. It's one of the biggest costs to play this game. And the vast majority of that cost is hidden. It does not show up anywhere. It does not show up on your statement. It does not show up as a deduction from your trades as much. It's crazy. So before we tackle this, before we actually tackle this, we need to talk about the history of commissions, where it's come from. And in order to do that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning role of a specialist. Now, Many of you have heard of the term specialist. It's a certain type of trader. It is a trader that is actually at the the top of the food chain or has historically been at the top of the food chain. That's changing a bit today. But they have historically been the absolute guaranteed winners at this game we call trading. They Their home was historically on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Today, it's supposed to still be on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. You've seen their roles in movies where they're in the jackets with the little plaque on the side. They're sitting in a pit and there are crowds of screaming, high screaming men with high blood pressure battling each other to gain the attention of the specialists. Give me 500,000 of this. Archer, I don't have 500,000, but I'll give you 300,000 at this price. Done. Yes, do. Go. And you've seen this in the movies. Some of you have seen it in real life. If you've visited the New York Stock Exchange before they shut the tours down. I don't know if they've reopened them, to be honest with you. But this role of a specialist has a very interesting history, has a very interesting start. You see, back in the early 1900s in the United States, the general public did not really play the market regularly. There was a segment of the general public who did, actually, but it was very, very small, minuscule, in fact. And so the playing of the market was really only conducted by the extraordinarily wealthy. Now, most of the wealthy would never touch equities or stocks. They would never own stock in a company because to them, that was low. It was a form of gambling. And so the term that was very popular in the early 1900s was gentlemen play bonds. Bonds are for gentlemen. And some of you may have heard that that age-old axiom, bonds are for gentlemen, which insinuates that if you play the stock market, you are dirty, you are not a gentleman, you are low, you are beneath me. Gentlemen, those who dress up with their top hats and their shiny patent leather shoes and their pocket watches and their eyepieces, these were the gentlemen of the day and they played bonds. In fact, the creation of the top hat or the proliferation of the top hat's use was created by wealthy men in the early in the early 1900s who were frequent bond players who traded paper and bonds, commercial paper and bonds. And they would literally put the bond coupons in the in the commercial paper coupons in their top hat and put their top hat on top of their head and walk down Wall Street. Or 
Water Street or Broad Street. And back in this day, traders, the taller your top hat, the wealthier you were. Because the, the height of your top hat indicated that you had a business, you had wealth that was so great that it required a ridiculous looking tall skyscraper of a top hat. And so one of the status symbols of walking around New York City was to walk around with the tallest top hat you could find. It was a symbol of wealth. But stocks never found them their way amongst the very wealthy inside of these top hats. But there were a few speculators. You see, back then, trading was not considered something worthy of a gentleman. If you did and you were wealthy, well, that's okay. A healthy form of speculation is proper for a gentleman every now and then, like going to Vegas. It's okay. We, we're all intelligent as gentlemen of wealth. We're all intelligent to know that you don't build billion-dollar casinos and lose very often. So we just go to have fun. We don't go with the expectation that we're going to win. We speculate and have fun and have dinner and see a show and we bring our loved ones and yeah, 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 yeah. You see? So stocks were used that way by the wealthy. Every now and then they'd do it for fun. Oh, you know, at a poker game with their buddies and someone mentioned some tip that they got because their friend runs this company. And of course they say, you know what, let's... Uh, Let's, as a group, speculate. They call them speculators, not traders. Tr the term traders came later. You were a speculator in the early 1900s because it wasn't worthy of any other name but to, let's just give this a shot and have some fun. But here is where the role of a specialist came into play. You see, every now and then, these wealthy speculators would actually get tired of the stock or need the money for something. Or maybe the stock ran up and they wanted to sell and lock in the profit. Or maybe the stock dropped and they're like, you know what, I don't want this anymore. So whatever the reason for them wanting to sell this speculation they had to find a buyer. But who, traders? Who would buy it? I mean, they did not have the, the liquidity of a market, the market that we experience and enjoy today. They did not have electronic trading where you simply hit the sell button for, for owning 2,000 shares of IBM and instantly it's gone. There were no frequent players. There was no market. There were no millions of individuals clamoring for that stock every single second of the day. So this speculator would hire a guy. They call a friend and a friend would say, yes, you know, um, I know a guy. And this guy actually specializes in this thing. What do you mean he specializes in? Yeah, he specializes in selling difficult things. Like you got you got 2000 shares of a company called General Electric, see back in the early 1900s, that was a speculation to own General Electric. Yeah, this crazy guy is an inventor created the light bulb, has this company, General Electric, and I speculated on it. Now I want to sell it. GE, General Electric. Thomas Edison, the founder of General Electric. The light bulb, the candescent light bulb. So I want to sell this General Electric. So you think this guy can find someone for me? 
Yeah, I think he can. He's done it for a few of my friends. So they have lunch together. They go, they invite this guy to have lunch with them. They're wealthy at some very fancy restaurant in Midtown, New York. And the specialist sits down with them. He says, well, listen, um, give me two weeks to a month and I'll find someone. How many shares do you have? You have 14,000 shares? I'll find someone to take it off your hands. And increasingly, as the popularity of speculating during some of the crazy market periods that made a lot of these speculators a lot of money, more people would want to speculate, all right? Especially as we got into the go-go 20s, they call it the 1920s. The role of the specialist became more and more important. He became used more importantly. Then his name of a specialist, instead of I got a guy, his name as a specialist came into play when he only represented stocks. He no longer was the guy who could sell anything. Like, I, you, you got a gold toilet you want to sell? I'll find a buyer for that. Oh, you got 14,000 shares of GAE? I'll find a buyer for that, too. He moved from being a general specialist of almost to be, being taking a fee from both sides. The guy who wants 14,000 shares takes a fee from him. The guy who's selling 14,000 shares takes a fee from them to bring those two people together. Takes money from both. Makes sense. Okay. Now, today, we have a similar market in the U.S. in particular and all over the world for that matter, but certainly in the U.S. The real estate market. The real estate market today is similar to how the equity market used to be before where you need a specialist. You need an agent because you don't have buyers in most cases today, you don't have buyers lining up out of your door just waiting for the day that you decide to sell your home. You're probably going to have to wait eight months to 18 months to 24 months to find someone that's willing to meet your price. The real estate market today is similar to how speculating used to be. It took time to find buyers and you needed a special guy a specialist to actually go out there so that you didn't have to market this or advertise for this go out there and find a buyer now sometimes the specialist would have to come back and say listen if you lower the price for the 14,000 shares to this my guy will take I got one guy who will take 60% of it I got another guy who'll take another 20% of it but you got to lower the price down to here and so the specialist began to work these guys. In many cases, the specialists would never let each one know who they are. Only the, the, the buyer and seller, each respectively knew the specialist, but the specialist would never let the buyer and the seller meet. So he'd go to the buyer and say, listen, if you're willing to raise your price, he'll give it all to you. And go back to the seller. If you're willing to lower your price, the guy will take it all. And he'd make money from both sides. He would then use his own capital to buy it from the buyer at the lower price and sell it to the, I mean, buy it from the seller at the lower price and sell it to the buyer at the higher price. And he actually encouraged the one to go higher and the other to go lower. And he grabs the middle. And thus happened the New York Stock Exchange Specialists, how specialists came into being. In the beginning of the days, there was no commission. There was just the spread. I take the difference between the prices that I created. I created a different price between the, the seller and the buyer, and I take the middle. When all of this began to be corporatized, corporations began to take over this function. 
they added additional fees offices and buildings and salaries and secretaries and pencils and paper clips and you get the point and so not only was there the spread there became additional transactional fees in addition to the spread and that is what you know commissions to be today it's the fee part the spread part is often the hidden part. But that's how it began, the spread part. You see? So now there's fees and the spread. So spreads have declined, decreased over the years. We are now trading, we're trading Forex and pips. How small is that spread? Infinitesimally small. We are trading, we went from trading stocks in fractions to pennies. See, when I, when I started trading, it was fractions. And stocks moved in quarters. So when a stock moves in a quarter, the next price from 94 is 94.25. Then the next price is 94.50. There were four price points in a dollar. Do you know how fast a dollar could happen because there's only four prices to go through. Now, when you go to fractions, there are 100 prices to go through to move a dollar. 94.01, 94.02, 94.03, hundred different prices. But when I started trading, there were four prices inside of a dollar, 25 cents apart. Some stocks traded $1 at a time. The bid was 94. The ask was 95. I used to trade a stock called Mitzi. We, we call it Mitzi. Microtouch. They're the company that created the touchscreens on, on ATM machines. And Mitzi used to trade $4 spread. $94 bid, $98 offer. And I used to trade that. So we went from wide spreads to narrow spreads today. And this is why the role of the specialist, his God-like status, has been hurt over the years to a certain extent because the wide spreads that used to be obtained by the NASDAQ market makers and the New York Stock Exchange specialists have decreased. But there are other things that have made up for their loss in certain ways. All right? But this is where it's all come from. The beginning of the profit from actually market players, not necessarily traders. They're traders in one way, but they're fee takers and spread creators in another way. So they have the trading side because the specialist in the middle who puts up his capital is really taking a risk. So if the specialist says, listen, if you bring your price down, the guy will take it all. And then he goes to the buyer and says, if you go raise your price just a little bit, I can get it for you for this. All of it. Creates the spread, but then he buys from one side. There's a term in the industry called uh, a reneg. All right. And it's short for the guy reneged on me. You know, the guy I bought from the seller, but the buyer decided not to buy and I'm stuck with it. So that part is the, the specialist and the market makers trading part of it where they can buy and get the merchandise and they own the merchandise. And now you're buying from them. You're buying from their merchandise. So these are all the roles. So the two fees I want you to be aware of are the spreads between the bid and the ask, the spread created by, well, in the past it used to be created by the specialists and market makers. Think about this. Why is there a spread? Have you ever thought of that? 
Why is there a bid and an ask? Why can't they be the same? Why can't there just be one price and this is what you pay for it? Why must there be a separation? Because that's where the money is. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's where the money is. The money is in maintaining a spread. The money is in never letting the spread go to zero. Forces, competitive forces have shrunk the spread, but have not completely eliminated the spread. Now, there are now other ways that the industry makes money from you. Spreads have diminished, so therefore their profits have diminished. Commissions have declined over the last 40 years. My first professional trade cost me for 1,000 shares of Intel, INTC, cost me $1,300 just to buy 1,000 shares, $1,300 to sell those 1,000 shares cost me 1,300. So from trade, the instant I executed my buy of Intel, I was down mentally in my mind, $2,600. I have to, my position has to go up by $2,600 just to break even. That was the commission world my professional trading career was born into. Today, when someone tells me they can't make money because of commissions of where they are today at $9 and $7 and $6 a trade in the retail space, I just laugh. Because if you started when I started, then you really have a problem. But today, $9 a trade and $6 a trade and four ninety-five a trade, these are all still extraordinarily expensive. And I'm going to explain to you why, but they really still are. It's still overpriced in today's world. Those commissions have not come down low enough to really be fair for the average individual market participant. But get this, the other ways that the industry makes money today is called assets under management. Do you see assets under management, which means these firms actually don't want you to trade because traders lose money. They want your assets just sitting there to use for other things. They would prefer to pay you 1% interest on your assets and convince you that that's amazing. That it's risk-free, it's guaranteed and backed by the faith of the, your government. It's not tremendous, but you're not taking a risk either. So this is the message of give me your wealth and I will throw you a few percentage points. You, don't, you will be able to sleep at night and I will take that and use it. And in exchange for your wealth, I will send you slips of paper in the mail every quarter. Or, not even that today, I will send you an email statement. An email statement of your wealth. So, you transfer real wealth and you get an email. <laughs> it's really not there. This is an amazing business. I give you my wealth and you give me an email. How's that? For years, and any time I have an itch to take my wealth back, I will get on the phone with you, and I will sell you on why that's not smart. And I will keep this game, this email game up forever is if I can. I will discourage you. I will tell you that trading is bad. That's the other side of the industry. That traders lose money, and they do. 92% lose money. I will tell you that the way to do this is long term. The way to do this is to never see your money again, actually. The way to do this is to create a will. 
Let me build it up for you. Give me your wealth and let me send you an email. I don't even want to send you a piece of paper to the mail anymore. Check this box for paperless statements. Email is easier and cheaper. Now, how's that? I give you my life savings and you give me an email. <laughs> I love it. It's such an amazing game, isn't it? Now, do you know what the fractional banking system is? Oh, it's a wonderful creation and America has mastered it. Oh, the fractional banking system. Oh, it's amazing. So now I take your $100 that you have put into your account. You are giving me 100. Now I'm just using 100 as you given $100,000 or whatever, but 100, let's keep it simple. I take the 100 and I give you an email. That email states you have 100, but I'm going to take your $100 and I'm, I'm going to take $90, right? It's a 10% reserve requirement by the Federal Reserve, which means that banks are supposed to maintain 10% of what you give them. The other 90% they can go use. So they take $90 of your $100 in savings and they give some business a loan. Guy wants to open up a shoe store or a, de another, a, a Mercedes dealer wants to expand his Mercedes dealership, but they give it to someone for a fee. But your money they give, they don't give their money, they give your money. $90 goes to someone else. Now, the dealership that wants to expand, who's just received your $90 and $10 from someone else, right? So he gets $100, 90 of which is yours. And he takes the $100 and deposits it in his bank. Now that $100 gets received by the bank, that bank sends an email to him. You have $100. They take $90 of that. Wait a minute. How many times are you going to split this? <laughs> they take $90 of that deposit and give it to a shoe guy who wants to build another shoe store across town. He gets, an, he gets $90 <laughs> of the second guy, the dealership guy. Now, the, 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 shoe, the shoe salesman... <laughs> Gets a hundred dollar loan, right? And deposits it in his bank and they take $90 from that. <laughs> Dude, by the time this $100 deposit gets lent out 270,000 times, is there really anything there? It's crazy. <laughs> is there really anything there? That's crazy. What an amazing hocus pocus trick. And this is what we call growth. <laughs> it's just the same. It's the, it's, it's the $100 divided in thousands and thousands of pieces. How crazy is that? <laughs> so that's the fractional system, but I digress a little bit because we're talking about commissions, but the reason why this is relevant is because the firms that say, listen, we will not charge you any commissions is really telling you, bring your wealth to me. It's creating one of the most powerful incentives for you to bring your wealth and have it sit there. Now, these firms actually prefer that you don't trade, even though they might use the trading hook. They really prefer you don't trade because they would rather use your money than have you lose it. If you lose it trading, what benefit does that have to them except a few dollars in commissions? They want a bigger game now. They want it sitting there for years. They want to lend it out 27,000 times. Like I told you in the fractional reserve system. All right. So 
you have now brokers are not rewarded by commissions. The traditional brokers, the ones that you can call, the ones that ask how the kids are doing, the ones that shows up, show up to your surprise birthday party, those guys and girls don't get paid based on commissions. They get paid based on the total amount of assets under their umbrella. Every one of them has an umbrella. And the king of the hill is though is the one who maintains the largest amount. So if one broker has a bunch of traders losing money every week, his assets are going down, not up. So if a broker has non-traders, bond buyers, and things of that nature, mutual funds that 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 invest in bonds and commercial paper and this and that, yada, da, da, da. fee-based ones, not the no-load, load mutual funds because they make a commission off that. They don't really, they're looking to grow assets under management. They get a percentage of, they get a bonus based on the percentage of money under their management, under their umbrella. I think it's too kind to say under their management. Too kind of a term. But here's what has happened in recent times, guys. And this is very interesting. What has happened is that the market has become so competitive and so fractured. New players have come into the exchange game. They used to just be the New York Stock Exchange. Then there was the American Stock Exchange. And then there was the NASDAQ stock exchange. And that's basically all you had. And then there was Instanet. The first purely non-human, in a way, exchange. You see, the NASDAQ started the computerized exchange. The New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange are the open cry system exchanges. They're people-driven, relationship-driven. I give the best prices to my friends. We go to dinner. Our wives get together. That was the open cry system. And people felt, people to this very day think that's fairer than purely electronic. The NASDAQ started the electronic exchange where there's just a group of people throughout the world trading over a computer. And all the trades go into this one network called the NASDAQ. And so that started the advent of the electronic movement. And then Instanet was the first non-human exchange called an ECN. Instanet bred competition because they were so successful that Island came into existence. And then Archipelago, I was one of the first traders to place a trade on the Archipelago ECN. Many ECNs came up, but these are some of the the biggest and most popular ones. Island became, Island and Instanet became INET. Archipelago became the New York Stock Exchange. I helped create some of the algorithms for um, for, uh, Archipelago. Archipelago patterned some of their algorithms from my trading and my traders trading. We used to get invited to Chicago to trade in the offices of Archipelago so that they could see how professional traders trade. I became very intimate friends with the creators of Archipelago, which is now Archipelago New York Stock Exchange, Jerry Putnam. Margwin Townsend and Stuart Townsend, the architects, the creators of Archipelago, which is now the New York Stock Exchange. Today, I push 6% of Archipelago's volume. We are responsible for that today. We have always been very powerful and very force, very, very large in the archipelago, now New York Stock Exchange world. Again, I digress. But what happened is that the competition 
to the New York Stock Exchange and ultimately the NASDAQ market as well became these new electronic exchanges, no humans, no open cry system, archipelago, island, instanet. You have bats, just a, a zillion of them. And so this has fractured the market. So instead of there being only one exchange you go to, you go to the NASDAQ, I mean, you go to New York Stock Exchange, then it became two. Not, you go to New York Stock Exchange or an American Stock Exchange. And if you do deal with this, you go to the American. If you deal with that, you go to New York. Then the NASDAQ. Uh, well, if you deal with tech or whatever, you go to the NASDAQ. Then it's like, no, wait a minute. I don't have to go to the big boys. I can go to some of the little electronic exchanges and maybe get a better price. And this is how the competition has shrunk the spreads in things because of the electronic exchanges that came into existence. Today, the market is still rather fractured. And because it's so competitive, they will pay for you to bring your orders to them. It is called adding liquidity. In every exchange today, worth anything, pays for you to place bids and offers on their exchange. That's, what, that's what's called adding liquidity. Listen to me carefully, traders. I'm about to make a point. <laughs> I know I'm going around in circles a little bit, but I'm about to make a point. It's a very important one. Every time you want to buy, if instead of buying at the ask, the higher price, and you try to get the bid, you sit your buy order on the bid, that is called adding liquidity. When you just pay up at the ask price, you are removing liquidity. There is someone asking at $20, you remove their ask at $20. That's removing liquidity from their market. You get charged by them. But if you, instead of paying up at the ask price, you decide I'm going to sit my buy order on the bid, you are now adding liquidity. Now, why will an exchange pay you to add liquidity? Because it creates more value. It makes the exchange more valuable if there's volume. So if, if every time I want to sell something, I can instantly get filled on this exchange. That exchange will get almost all of my business. Do you understand? That every time I want to sell, I can sell instantly. I don't have to lose the current price to, to go down in price to get my merchandise sold. I can go to this exchange and they always have an instant buyer. So they want people to place buys and sell orders. But... That creates or increases the value of their exchange. Now, listen to this carefully. When you open up an account at a traditional retail brokerage firm, an E-Trade, a Charles Schwab, a TD Ameritrade, a trade station, an IB, do you realize that the payment that's supposed to go to you for adding liquidity when you do that, you never get. It's paid to you, but it's paid to your agent who doesn't pass it through to you. Guys, we are talking billions upon billions of dollars hidden from retail traders. These payments are supposed to be theirs. In fact, many of these firms will sell your orders to the exchange, receive a payment, and you don't get any of it. As a professional trader, you get every single fee that the exchanges pay to traders. The exchanges are so competitive today, they pay traders to actually trade there. And the payment is often higher than your commission. So it becomes not just commissionless trading for a professional trader. It becomes 
being paid for trading. So not only does a professional trader have the ability to make money off their own trading, I buy a stock at 20, I sell it at 21, I made $1. They actually can make the dollar and get two payments, one for the buy and one for the sell order that the exchange paid me to place my orders on their exchange. I got two payments. I placed my buy order on their exchange, got a payment. I sell order on their exchange. I got another payment and I made my dollar. And the payment I made is bigger than the commission my broker charges. So I received $3 as an example, and my commission was $1.50. I made, I'm just giving you an example. I made $1.50 on this trade. I made another $1.50 on that trade. So my commission is not even a commission. I don't pay commissions. I get paid a commission to place my trades there. But every trader gets paid this. But the retail traders get robbed. The retail brokers take your payments. And on top of that, to add insult to injury, they charge you a commission to do it. They charge you the commission and take your payment. And sometimes they sell your order flow to a single player. And let me tell you how that works. If you don't have the whole market available to you, all the exchanges, and you only have one available to you, then you won't get fair pricing all the time, sometimes and sometimes not. Because what if other exchanges have a better pricing, but your order must always go to this guy because your firm is in contract with that guy to send all of their orders to this one guy. And this guy paid $8 million for that contract for the year. Now all of that firm's orders, retail orders, get shot to that guy. But what if another guy has a better price? And some of them will get you by calling it smart routing. Use our smart routing, which is smart right to the guy they, they, that pays them. That's smart, all right. This is smart routing. This is crazy. This is the hidden part of the world. This is what people don't understand when they say, but Oliver, why do you call your traders professional? Because we are. Because you pay $10 a trade, and my traders pay six pennies for every 100 shares. I mean, think about the difference of this, guys. Think about six pennies. I'm talking about red pennies. They buy 100. How much is that per share? They buy 100 shares of Apple. Six cents. They sell 100 shares of Apple. Six cents. Their commission, 12 cents. The commission... At some firms, retail firms, $20. That's crazy. Do you know how many shares my traders have to trade to have $20 in cost? Tens of thousands of shares before they hit $20 in a commission fee. It's six pennies. For every 100 shares, do the math. But do you know how much more they have to trade to ever reach $20 in commissions if they're also getting their commissions offset by the payments that they receive for placing their orders on various exchanges? It's crazy, guys. Professionals get paid to actually trade in addition to their trading profits. And how many retail traders have no concept of this? How many retail traders realize that there is a rebate you're supposed to be receiving? 
How many people, how many traders realize that if you place a certain type of order, you get a payment? Without the stock moving, you get it just for placing that type of order. There's a fee the exchange will pay you. The New York Stock Exchange will pay you. The NASDAQ will pay you. Archipelago will pay you. INET will pay you. But you've got to be a professional because the retail firms are going to take your payment. And this is a hidden fee. It's hidden. Of course, there's a firm that says there's no commissions. They receive your rebates. They get big contractual fees to just send your order to this one guy. That's how you can have a Robin Hood. That's how you can have a firm that claims to have zero commissions because the payment is bigger than the commission. This is why my traders can trade not only commissionless, they can get paid. Commissionless is just zero commissions. But when you go beyond zero and get payments, that's an extra revenue stream. The way I teach my traders to trade in this professional world, they one third, up to one third of their PL can be these extra payments. I have a question for you. If you went back over the last two years and you calculated all of your commissions, if you got all of that back and then you added 5% on top of that, so every dollar you spent in commissions, and then add 5%. So you got everything you spent on commissions plus an extra 5% of that back. I guarantee you, you'd be close to being profitable. Do you understand how, what the percentage of your losses are in loss fees, not getting your rebate when you're supposed to get your rebate and getting charged on top of it? And inappropriate pricing because your firm has sold your order flow to this one guy. When you add up all of those costs, you get robbed of your rebate, the wider spread because they sold your order flow, and you get hit with the fee, the commission fee. When you add up all of that, the odds like Vegas shift to you being a almost a guaranteed loser. You can't combat all three of those very easily. It's already a difficult game when you add those three hurdles that you don't get help from your rebates, that your, your pricing is off a lot of times. You're not getting the best executions. Executions are one of the biggest hidden fees in the industry. If they clip you for a penny several times a day, it's hundreds of millions of dollars in mass. It's crazy. This is a game of pennies. Billions of shares shaving a penny off. There was a movie back in the 1970s called Superman. Christopher Reeves, I believe it was. And one of the world's most popular comics at the time was Richard Pryor. He played in the movie and he was the head of payroll of some large company in the city of Metropolis or whatever city it was. I don't know if you guys remember this movie. And he got into a little bit of trouble in the movie because there were like 30,000 employees in the company and he would steal two cents or something like that out of every paycheck every single week from every single employee. And that over the years, he had accumulated <laughs> quite a stash. And this is what happens to you all day long. Do you understand? This is what happens to you all day long. 
clipped for a penny because your orders were sold to this guy, this one guy, robbed of your rebates and charged on top of that to add insult to injury and a charge that is so astronomical compared to commission rates. Guys, my commission rates have actually gone up. The lowest I've ever had in commissions. This is crazy. This is going to blow your mind. All right? Was. It's going to go crazy. Ten cents a thousand shares. Ten cents a thousand shares. That's one penny for a hundred shares. One penny. One penny, a hundred shares of Apple buy, one penny. A hundred shares of Apple sell, two pennies, commission done. Then my rebate was a dollar twenty five, a dollar twenty, dollar twenty five for placing the thousand shares. So I would give a dollar twenty five minus two pennies. No, I'm sorry. Two dollars and fifty two dollars and fifty cents. So a dollar twenty five to buy, I would receive. A dollar twenty five to sell, I would receive. So that's two dollars and fifty cents I would receive, and that my I would you would have to deduct my commission fee from what I received two pennies. And this is when I went crazy. My traders and I went crazy be, being rebate traders. We traded for the rebate. Think of sitting all day long placing orders just to receive the 125. 125, 125, 125. You never wanted a stock to move. You just wanted to buy it and sell it at the same price. Buy it and sell it at the same price, 225 minus two cents. Let's do it tens of thousands of times over and over and over again. And then in order to play that game, you went to stocks that didn't move. And back then when it became, when it was very popular, you had like Citibank at $4, $3. It didn't move. You know? And you just sat there on the bit in the ask and just trading tens of millions upon millions of shares just for the rebate. While retail traders are messing around getting their financial life sucked out of them and not even knowing it. This is the hidden secret of this game. And guys, I will have to tell you this. It's this, it's this important. I have to reveal to you before I go. I have to reveal to you. Why? These fees and commissions will almost guarantee that you're a loser. I have to reveal some, I have to reveal what I call the trader's math to you so that you get this. And this is the most important part of my broadcast today. So I need you really, really focused. There is a special math for traders. And I guarantee you that the vast majority of traders have no idea of what this basic math is. And many of you might be appalled at the basic math of traders, but I feel it's my fiduciary responsibility for following me, for supporting me. I want you enlightened. Here it is. Out of every 10 trades, 
you are going to have, on average, and this applies to every one of you, you are going to have one very decent winning trade. One. I don't care who you are. I do not care how long you've been at this game. You are going to have one very decent trade. One every 10. Every now and then you'll get two. But the vast majority of the time, you're going to get one decent, really decent. I mean, really decent. Like, wow, that was nice. One out of every 10. You are also going to have one blow that sets you back. One blow out of 10. Now we're down to eight trades left. So one is going to be very, very, very decent. Another one is going to be a solid punch in your face. I mean, not a tap, not a love tap, not a, what are you doing? I'm talking about a punch in your face. And that one's going to offset much of the win. Now let's go over the other eight. There's going to be two break evens, two out of every 10. So we got one decent winner, one really decent winner, one punch in the face, and then we got two break evens. So we got four trades, you're almost 50% there, and you haven't really made anything. You are going to have one small winner and one small loss. Now we have six trades done, one very decent winner out of every 10, one punch in the face, that's two. You're going to have two break evens, that's four trades right there. You're gonna have one small winner, that's five trades, and one small loser, that's six trades. Now, where are we from a PL perspective? Now, add commissions, fees, and the robbing of your rebates. Now tell me where you are. But let me finish the numbers. There are four trades left. There's a medium-sized winner in there. So let me make you feel a little bit better. There's a medium-sized winner, not the really, really decent winner, and not the little small winner, but a decent-sized one. Okay? But there's a medium loss. Now we're down to two. So far, we're almost canceled out here. These two trades, traders. These two trades are the toss up. And it is these two trades that determine who you are. Are you a freaking chronic loser? Because these two trades will make you deep in negative territory. You will use these two throwaway trades. You will use them to be negative every single set of 10. A master uses these trades to stay in the green after every set of 10 trades. They're profitable because of what they do with these two trades. Most people dwindle these two trades away and fees and commissions and wider spreads than you're supposed to be paying bigger commissions than you're supposed to be paying and the robbing of your rebates in addition to you throwing away these two trades will make you go to the poorhouse every single time your life the trader depends on these two trades what you do with them
because I am telling you, the math that I just explained to you is for everyone. Small and great, rich and poor, master and neophyte. It's these two trades that determine your pedigree. It's these two trades that determine whether you know what you're doing or not. It's these two trades that determine whether you go to the poorhouse or you wind up wealthy as a trader in this game. This is your life as a market participant to beat the fees, to beat the commissions, to beat the wider spreads and you're supposed to be playing is harder to do it as a professional. It's easier because in addition to these two trades, if you learn how to do the right thing with these two trades and in addition to that, get your rebates and pay your institutional commission fees of six cents and 10 cents and not dollars. You throw yourself into the higher odds category of doing this. But I am telling you traders, the line that separates a loser from a winner is very, very thin. It's fees and it's two trades. I promise you today, you stick around you stay here and I will get you through these two trades. My name is Oliver Velez and I am your trader for life.